The time has finally come. Humankind releases on Tuesday, August 17th. Four years in development by the Amplitude Studios, the last year under the open dev scenarios cater to specifically allow the community to play the game and give their direct feedback. It's a game that has seen some highs and lows throughout this community, creating loads of hype for some while instilling some concern for others, especially as it was delayed by four months from April into now August. Hello everybody, my name is Havoc, and I am very excited to finally give my review for Humankind from the perspective of a person who has not only played every single open dev scenario, but is also engaged with you, the community, to create a series of critique videos, voicing mine and others' criticisms as development continued through these open devs. In this review, we will take a broad look at the game initially, then dig into why it's unique among other 4X strategy games, leading into the good as well as the criticisms, and eventually wrapping up with my honest thoughts of the process and what has led us here to release, and my thoughts on the game at this state. Before we take that dive though, a couple of things to mention. First, I did receive a pre-release copy of this game from Amplitude. It's immensely appreciated, but this early access itself does not sway my opinion of the game. Second, if at any point you're enjoying this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel for future content, and turn on those bell notifications. Lastly, if you have yet to purchase the game, you have uh, two-ish primary options. If you want to support the channel, you can buy the game off of my Nexus Game Store, giving you a 100% valid Steam key straight from the developers. Or, you can try the game out on Xbox Game Pass for PC, where it will be live on that platform right at day one. Obviously, purchasing through Nexus is the way to go, but if you choose Game Pass, no hard feelings, but do let me know if you did, that way I can gauge some metrics on how you went about getting the game. With that bundle of info out of the way, let's finally dive into my review for Amplitude Studios Humankind, beginning with what is Humankind. Humankind is a 4X hex grid turn-based strategy game developed by Amplitude Studios and published by Sega, where you will rewrite the entire narrative of human history by creating a civilization entirely unique to you, the player, beginning with a single tribe in the Neolithic, progressing through a total of six eras to present day, maybe slightly into the future. In Humankind, you will create cities, research technology, build units, engage in diplomacy, and develop your empire through event decisions and civic enactments, pushing your civilization to create its own distinct ideology and influencing other civilizations around you that are all doing the exact same thing. If most of this sounds similar to another game, don't feel bad. Lots of other people have indeed made the same comparison, often to the point of even calling humankind a simple reskinned clone of that other guy. And there certainly are similarities. It is an Earth-like 4X hex grid turn-based strategy game after all. But let me tell you, there is so much more to humankind than meets the eye. So what makes humankind unique? I'm glad you asked. While there is an entire video's worth of what actually makes humankind unique in total, view a mostly still relevant video in the top right, there are about four to six, maybe seven-ish, rather large elements I want to point out for this review. First, and probably the largest, is cultures. I mentioned that humankind takes you through six different eras spanning the near entirety of human history. You'll do this through gaining era stars, which are a set of goals like integrating a certain number of territories, gaining enough gold, or destroying a number of units. You need seven of these era stars to progress to that next era. However, in every era past the Neolithic, you get the choice to select one of 10 cultures for that era, each with their unique legacy trait, specialty building, and special unit. The best part? You then stack each new culture in the next era on top of your previous one. 10 cultures per era, six eras. That means you have at the moment 60 cultures to choose from during your campaign to craft a completely unique civilization made up from your six selections. Six unique traits to stack as you play, six unique buildings to build, six unique units you can use as your campaign progresses. There are well over a million different combinations of civilizations that you can craft, ensuring replayability like nothing we've really seen in a strategy game like this. 
While not an actual in-game mechanic per se, you can create and customize your own avatar. There is a wide range of presets available, skin color, facial structure, eye shape and color, facial features like freckles or birthmarks, different hairstyles or lack thereof, and also a color feature on your clothing. See, as you level up, your character will take on the clothing of the culture you adopted, and it will use whatever clothing color you choose to highlight the various garbs. I love any sort of customization like this, and it's not too often we get to do so within a strategy game. And it makes things just a bit more personal, allowing you to make the character that you want leading your empire throughout your campaigns. Where it does turn into the in-game mechanic is that alongside creating your avatar, you have the opportunity to make an AI persona of, well, anybody you want. It could be a representation of yourself or of just the ideal version of who you want to play against. There are three main areas of developing your character, archetypes, strengths, and biases. Archetypes set your personality by tipping the balance of three traits in different directions. Strengths are direct benefits to your empire's economics, military, etc., etc. And biases influence the objective of your AI, prioritizing things like making luxury deposits or ensuring that you exact revenge if someone slights you. Now, you only have the ability to choose a couple of points in each section, which gives your avatar points that denote the difficulty of the AI you create. And you'll also notice that not everything is unlocked, meaning you'll have to accomplish various things as you're playing other campaigns to enable them. This gives rise to the potentially evolving AI that you can then send to your friends and have them play against you. Or in this case, I'll send my expert mode AI code out to the community for them to enjoy and hopefully get destroyed by me. No guarantees to that though. It's a very fun and awesome mechanic that brings together the sense of community in an enjoyable and not often seen feature in this genre. Next up is fame. There is only one way to win with humankind, and that is fame. Fame is a point system generated by accomplishing various things throughout the game, such as completing era stars or through discovering natural wonders and a few other ways on top of that. Whoever has the highest fame score by the end of the game wins. It's that simple. What is an interesting part about this is that since fame is the way to win, there is always the possibility that a civilization that was wiped from the game could still win if they have the highest number of points. This means that killing off civs isn't a guaranteed way to victory, just to rather end the game and still see who has the highest points. And therefore the focus turns to which of the X number of avenues to gain fame can I take to sort of get ahead. Some people don't like this approach, but with so many ways to gain fame points, I think it's a brilliant approach to the typical systems of the genre of games. Moving on to expansion. There are no settlers in humankind. Well, that's actually not true. Okay, there are no actual settlers until like era five or six. Instead of settlers, your military units will be able to build outposts, essentially a flag stamp in the ground to claim this piece of land as your own. These pieces of land are entire territories as well, allowing you to take advantage of any and all resources within those territories, almost exactly like Endless Legend. The downside is that these outposts can be ransacked if left unguarded, losing you that territory and anything you've created in it. These outposts can, however, either be turned into cities themselves using a resource called influence, or it can be assimilated into an already existing city, also costing influence. The benefit to the latter is that you can then absorb any exploited tiles from that territory into the city it is attached to, boosting any of your city resources as it can. Using this method, it is feasible to have a single, massive, Judge dread style city that can take up an entire continent, if you know how to manage it correctly, which can be difficult, let me tell you. The goal with expansion is to explore the map, see what territories are the most lucrative, and immediately try and place an outpost before anyone else does. You can have unlimited outposts, but they will increase in influence cost for each one that you place, so it's important to balance outpost generation with your other influence dependent mechanics, like enacting civics or attaching other territories to your cities. Next to last are crises, demands, and war support. Sure, these are actually three different things, but they all tie together very tightly. There are certain actions that can create a crisis, something you need to address to the offending civilization. That action could be something as simple as trespassing or 
taking a territory close to you, or simply having a different religion. Pushing these crises creates a demand where the defending party demands recompense like money or giving up that territory. Pushing these demands increases your war support, something akin to the Paradox Grand Strategy game's war score. Think of it like getting your people on board with the fact that those guys over there, we, we gotta do something about them. A high enough war support will allow you to start a war where it then becomes the objective to whittle down your opponent's war score to zero while not allowing your own war score to get to zero in order to win. It's a very fun system to push and a simple battle or a lost city can 100% tip the balance of a war one way or the other as war score is adjusted every turn based on the events that occurred during the previous turns. The last that I'll mention in terms of big mechanics are battles. If you've played Endless Legend, you'll be completely familiar with the order system of battles. If you haven't, let me break it down. Armies are composed of several units, whose number is determined by your technology and or specific cultural traits. On entering battle against an enemy, a specific part of the campaign map opens up where units have to remain inside of it for the duration of that battle. After deploying your troops using various terrains to your advantage, you'll have a series of turns on both sides to attack, defend, reposition, etc, etc. There are two goals with battles, wipe out every unit on the map, or take or defend the defender's flag. Should the attacker successfully take and hold that flag for a few turns, the battle is automatically over and any remaining units will remain alive. Battles are some of the most intense pieces of humankind and it takes some tactical strategizing to really pull ahead, especially when you're outnumbered, but it is completely possible. But wait, that's not all. There are other smaller systems at play, like civics and religion, which can influence your empire in nearly every aspect of your economy, your military, your religion, and even diplomacy. You can push your religion and ideology to other civs, gaining you some momentum to take advantage of their lesser stature. There are several district types, each allowing you to exploit the hex tiles in a variety of ways to gain you food, industry, money, science, influence, gold, or faith to develop your empire. Diplomacy is not 100% there yet, but the systems in place are very cool, like tolerating skirmishers, which allow you to attack anyone in your territory or on neutral ground without declaring war. Or there's stability, a measure of public order in your empire. Get it too low and your people can rebel against you, causing some massive headaches. There's even wonder sharing, where multiple cities can contribute their industry production towards a single wonder to build it quicker and then move along. There are also completely new mechanics that we haven't even seen from the last open dev that have been introduced, like how several cultural special buildings now count as actual districts. Three different districts in Carthage's Cawthon, for instance, even seeing the number of small tweaks across most of the cultures. And good lord, it's not really a mechanic, but can I still mention that humankind has some of the best daggum music in a video game that I've heard in a good long while? It really sets me in the mood to play, so huge kudos to the team on that front. I'm painting mostly in these broader strokes to give you just a hint of what goes on without basically writing a tips and tricks guide, but you get the idea. There is so much going on in humankind that truly helps it stand apart without being so overwhelming that it is not approachable to new players, which is incredibly important to consider. Which then leads to the bigger question of, how does it play out? Well, without sounding too cliche, it plays out as an ever-evolving and adaptive campaign like nothing I've honestly ever played before. One small piece of information I forgot to mention in the last section is that cultural selection is on a first-come, first-served basis. The risk versus reward of nabbing some extra fame by staying in the current era could cost you. If you're not the first to move into the next era, there's the possibility that you won't get the next era culture that you really, really wanted. If you don't get the culture you were hoping for, you'll have to adapt to what's left, and it might require you to switch gears in an entirely different direction than where you were headed. If you were hoping for a military-heavy culture like the Huns or Mongols, but you lingered too long and now you're stuck with, say, the Axumites, while well, their special unit really isn't half bad, 
It might be a better idea to embrace the Axumite's immense money-generating skills, setting up trade and building up your treasury to maybe get in early with the next era and take that best military culture then. Or perhaps you'll like the money and just decide to take another trading-focused culture, something you didn't expect to happen. Even if you get the culture you want, the idea of choosing new cultures plays heavily into campaign progression and that just mentioned evolution and adaptation. You may have chosen the Harapins, a food production focused culture in the ancient era. That gets your empire churning out population like crazy. Then when you progress to the classical era, you realize you've really neglected your industry production. And despite having lots of pops, it takes you a good while to build anything. The Maya are building masters, cranking out industry specialty buildings that could explode your industry production, making them the perfect fit for your second era culture. Cultural selection will hands down shake up your campaign. It affects what districts you choose to build based on what the culture can exploit more of. There are non-district buildings called constructibles, specifically designed to enhance your districts in a variety of ways. Which constructibles you choose to create will be affected nearly as much by your culture as the districts. This creates sets of synergized districts that can massively boost your empire in any of the various resource mechanics that humankind has, and combined with the fact that you can build specialty buildings repeatedly, well, only once per territory, it allows you to really min-max your culture if you choose to operate that way. It will affect your game plan in nearly every campaign, but not in a negative way, at least not always. The idea that I don't stick to a single set of traits, buildings, and units means that I can react to the world that is building around me and be flexible, rather than regret having taken, say, the Americans on turn one, where I cannot even access my special unit or building until the mid to late game. Having a relevant set of cultures in every era ensures that your campaign remains engaging and entertaining while not being stuck in a single set the entire game. Although, transcending is an option. And just real quick, the benefit there is gaining more fame points. So you can do another risk versus reward where you can gain extra fame points, again, the only way to win, but you will stay within that civilization for another era. The cultural progression in humankind definitely portrays this idea of leading humanity through history, even when things really start rolling once you hit the industrial and modern eras. If you think the previous four eras seem slow or just take a while to really get going, the last two eras will require you to strap in your seatbelt and put a helmet on because they evolve extremely quick and in more and more drastic leaps. It's in the industrial era where we get a glimpse of mass production, larger leaps in technology, and rapid social progression. Constructibles and district synergies, combined with big booms in population, give rise to huge gains of city resources like food, industry, money, and science. Technology really starts to scale up, allowing for more advanced units, most of which can now attack at longer ranges and at deadlier combat strengths than their previous era counterparts. It also increases army sizes, giving rise to larger battles, where it might not be too uncommon to have two to four dozen troops in a single engagement. Feudalism becomes a rather outdated form of control, and now you'll have to deal with discontent or put civic policies into place that will increase stability, or at least reduce what was already taking a hit. And the modern era takes all of that even a step further, creating a hustle and bustle we don't see in any era before it. Railways let troops instantly cross continents, Battleships and airplanes lend you support outside of the actual battlefield, and more potential unrest as pops demand more freedoms through the civic policies. You're cranking out buildings or units like a madman, hoping not to stagnate your empire's growth or tank your economy. While I enjoyed all of the previous eras, I really feel that idea of endgame and quick progression in the last two eras. It's in these last two where your decisions can really make a difference, be it diplomatically, through conquest, or even environmentally, as pollution becomes a realization and mistreating the planet too harshly can actually end the game prematurely. It's these late game choices that matter as one slip up this late could spell disaster for the empire you've spent the entirety of human history creating. Luckily, thanks to the fame mechanic, you could still win even if you slept up so hard as to get wiped out. But is it really worth the risk? Or should you just last minute try some new strategies to, again, adapt to the situation at hand, relying on the culmination of your ancestors to get you through to the end? 
It's a wild ride in the end game, and it's one that I rather enjoyed exploring. Not everything is sunshine and rainbows though, despite the trend of this video so far, which leads us to the not so great things, steamrolling, balancing, and yes, the huns. Steamrolling and balancing go hand in hand with each other and have been prevalent throughout development and the open devs. The fact of the matter is that humankind still needs help in both of these areas. Steamrolling in humankind is often not hard to accomplish, at least not in the metropolis or nation difficulties, metropolis being normal, and nation being one step up. Those synergies I spoke about earlier, min-max hard enough, which oftentimes isn't that hard since humankind will literally show you the best spot for every building, and you'll either be swimming in money, bathing in influence, or playing with riflemen while your opponents are still figuring out knights and halberdiers. In many cases, it's not difficult to take advantage of stacking tech, constructibles, and districts to create super cities where even a city with no industry workers whatsoever can still churn out well over three to 400 industry every single turn, or you're gaining a new pop every like two turns. This is a big issue for the game because as we've seen in the past, while steamroll for the most part is inevitable as a player versus the AI, if steamrolling hits too soon, then the player tends to get bored, either not completing the campaign or just in turn spamming while slapping down every possible building simply because they have the means to. The systems that humankind have in place encourage the player to finish their campaigns, especially regarding unlocking different features for your avatar AI, for instance, and to do it in a meaningful way. So if the player never gets there, we have a problem. Again, this comes down to balance. I'm honestly okay with having mechanics in place that allow steamrolling later in the game. It's in the late game where fame points can really matter, where a failed alliance could hit you hard and suddenly you need to react quickly and effectively, which can only be accomplished by churning out huge sums of these cities' resources. Yet it seems like anything below nation, that balance really isn't there yet. I played through an entire 300 turn campaign on normal or metropolis for this review. I was steamrolling hard by the medieval era, conquering new continents, researching new texts. In the modern age, I took down three empires using only two armies, each made up of four riflemen and two artillery. I was honestly pretty bored by that time, I'm not gonna lie, using conquest to just satiate my desire for excitement. I still had fun playing through to the end, but it wasn't quite as fun or challenging as I had hoped. It's not all bad though, from the last open dev scenario to the release version, Amplitude has put in several massively scaling balance measures into place, like scaling influence reduction the further you go over your city limit. This ensures you don't paint the map with 20 cities, encouraging assimilation, vassalage, or extermination to accomplish total control. Buyout costs do scale as well, making things still affordable, but unable to purchase in huge quantities every single turn. I think that both steamrolling and balancing will ever be a work in progress, and at no time while playing, even when I was bored, did I ever feel this game wasn't up to par. Again, I was playing on the normal difficulty where the AI does not get any benefits, and it's also not easy balancing literally millions of combinations of cultures across a game this large. So I hope that there will always be looking for ways to make everything work out while still remaining fun and engaging. Now on to the Huns. They've been a thorn in my side since the first open dev we could access them. And right up front, I want to say this. While I do enjoy a good sense of historical accuracy, sometimes you have to sacrifice accuracy for enjoyable and or balanced gameplay. And to this very day, I still think the Huns need an entire rework or removed from the game entirely. The largest contributing factor to my dislike of the Huns in the classical era is their ability to spawn units cheaply and in mass, while also having one of the most advanced tactical abilities in the entire game. As the Huns, you cannot attach outposts to cities, but they can be points of production for their special unit, the Hun Accord. Hun Accords only require influence in these outposts, one single horse resource and a population to produce them, bypassing industry entirely or the buyout costs of gold as well. Oh, and through killing units and ransacking other outposts, they can literally spawn more units inside their own army. The Hunnic Hordes also have some of the highest combat strength in the era, and combined with their ability to move, then hit, then move again, it means you can move in, attack your opponent with an attack that cannot be counter-attacked, mind you, and then move away out of reach. As the Huns, if they get attacked, they can counterattack with their ranged units, giving a possibility for two full-fledged attacks per turn. There are no other cultures in this era whose tactical ability comes close to matching the Huns, 
And when the AI gets a hold of it, it is absolutely devastating at higher difficulties where the AI gets resource buffs and a debuff to things like upkeep and production costs. This is where sacrificing historical accuracy comes into play. As my favorite slice of history being the rise of the Huns and their influence in the fall of the Roman Empire, I am fully aware of how OP they were historically. They were fast, overpowering, and just overall D-bags. And that is how they are represented in the game. Yet for the sake of enjoyable gameplay, and considering that the Mongols of the next era are literally just slightly upgraded Huns, we don't need two entire eras, or one third of the entire game, to be dominated by such a deadly force that the AI can just overwhelm you every single time. Sure, there's historical accuracy to it, but if I ever reach the classical era and the AI have taken the Huns, it puts a weight on my campaigns that is not enjoyable in any way, shape, or form. And having to just buckle down and pray I don't get wrecked every single campaign detracts from the game's appeal overall. Now, if you get the Huns of the Mongol as a player, it's a blast 100%. If the AI can dominate with them, having a player make more logical and tactical moves is amazing. I honestly highly recommend trying if you get them every time. But I would rather lose the Hans as a sieve if it meant I had to deal with such a dominating force in only one era instead of two. Now with all the aforementioned things in mind, it's time to give you, the audience, my thoughts on humankind. It's pretty dang clear from the live streams, multiple critique videos, and other content I've generated that I am very passionate about this game. I have easily played close to 200 hours or more between open devs and the pre-release build. And my time playing this has always been a best foot forward in making Humankind a better game with constructive feedback that encouraged the community to get involved. To say that Humankind has a lot of potential is a vast understatement. I don't even think a lot of the community really understands it, much less those who play other strategy games. And that's not a negative statement, by the way. I'm not trying to offend anyone watching. It is simply a natural progression of thought if you've seen the quite oftentimes imbalanced state of the open devs. And it can be off-putting to see a video title of Humankind Still Needs Work, which is one of my videos, or heavily critical videos and live streams during the entire development cycle. But all of that feedback went into what I've been playing since last Tuesday. And what I have played in the last week has shown me that Amplitude knows what they are doing even if it's down to the wire before release. This is the most balanced build of the game I've played so far, even when you consider that previous section. Is the game perfect? Absolutely not. There is a guaranteed impossibility considering the scope of the game as a whole. That being said, Humankind right at this instant is fantastic. It's extremely playable and well worth the investment. I have played more offline for pure fun than I have for the purpose of creating this kind of content, and. I don't see that changing anytime soon. The combination of cultures and unique mechanics, the wide array of gameplay styles that make you adapt to an ever-evolving situation is just great. And especially once they hammer out some balance issues, however that may look, I think we'll see humankind being played for a good while yet and stand large amongst the other 4X turn-based strategy games out there in the world. Replayability is again on a scale that no other game outside of perhaps Paradox Grand Strategy could come up against. And this is just on release, not considering future civs, DLC, free content, custom scenarios, and good lord not even taking modding into effect. Humankind is a game that I'm glad I picked up from that very first open dev, and I'm incredibly happy to see it make its way to release and look forward to covering it and playing it for a very long time. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and listening to me ramble about Humankind. Hopefully it all makes sense and gives you a great source of information to make a decision on whether this is your game or not. If you want a detailed breakdown tutorial of the game, be on the lookout for my upcoming tutorial series, Humankind, a tutorial for absolute beginners, where I'll run through nearly everything live with some gameplay to help you understand the various mechanics around the game. If you haven't yet purchased Humankind, I highly recommend buying it through my Nexus game store, as mentioned in the intro, it's a fantastic way to show your support for me and the channel. However, remember that it is going to be available on Xbox Game Pass for PC right at launch. So check it out there if you prefer, but if you want to keep it for good, the Nexus link will always be up and running, so no worries there at all. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and turn on those notifications. Thank you for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Stay tuned for several pieces of humankind content on the channel for a good while now. This is Havoc, and I will see you all in the next one.